you see at the very top of the screen on this slide, it says assumptions plus data implies conclusions. I, uh, that's a, uh, 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 either something very trivial or very uh, fundamental that I repeat to myself uh, all the time and, and to students as well. And uh, the data are fairly weak on COVID. And so anything that you've been uh, seeing about it requires uh, connecting the data with uh, some pretty strong assumptions to try to interpret the data. And what Francesca and I are trying to uh, do, and this is kind of formal econometric work, although there won't be any math in what I uh, present, is to try to understand uh, formally uh, how the data and assumptions combine to, to see what conclusions we can draw. So there, the, the, the particular focus is gonna be on the basic statistic is what the infection rate actually has been. Uh, to date, and I'm sure everybody sees statistics on that uh, day in and day out. And uh, there, there's a, a multitude of problems. We're going to focus on two of them. First, there's a uh, quite obvious uh, missing data problem is that the statistics that are reported on a daily basis are on um, what are called confirmed cases. And to become a confirmed case, you have to be tested, and then you have to have a, a positive uh, test result. Uh, so there's no data at all, of course, for people who have not been tested. And uh, the people who have been tested may differ uh, significantly from uh, people who have not been tested. Uh, I don't know whether anyone listening in on this has, has been tested, but I'm sure everybody knows that uh, with uh, tests being uh, not that readily available, there are kind of stringent criteria that have been used to determine eligibility for testing. That either you have to have uh, symptoms associated with infection, and in many places they're quite severe symptoms to be called uh, uh, deemed eligible for testing, or you have to have had close contact with infected people. So we have, uh, and, and the fraction of people who've been tested, I'll come back to this later, across the United States, it, it's roughly about 1%, okay? So it's about 99% of people have not been tested. And uh, all these 99% who have not been tested, it, it seems clear that some of them uh, actually have been infected, but uh, maybe typically have mild cases, maybe asymptomatic, or maybe they'll develop severe cases, but so far they're pre-symptomatic. So we just don't know what fraction of the untested um, people actually have been infected. What that means is something systematic, the actual rate of infection has been higher than the reported rate. I think that's a problem that most people are uh, quite uh, aware of, has been discussed often. There's a second issue that um, has received some attention, uh, but not nearly as much. And it's one that we all need to be aware of if we're uh, actually tested ourselves, is that the uh, prevalent tests for infection, these the nasal swab tests, uh, are not fully accurate. And moreover, it, there's a great asymmetry in it. There are uh, two measures of accuracy we'll talk about. One is the positive predictive value. And the positive predictive value means um, if you did receive a positive test result, what's the chance that you actually uh, have the uh, disease? And the positive predictive value uh, seems, there seems to be consensus that that's very close to one. Uh, I talked to one infectious disease expert at uh, Northwestern at the Feinberg Medical School. I've seen a lot of uh, uh, reports on this and there seems to be consensus that if you get a positive result, then yes, um, you really do have the virus. The other hand, there's a negative predictive rate. Let's say that you get a negative result on the test. Does that mean that you're clean, that you uh, are not infected? And that seems to be far more problematic. The uh, negative predictive rate, uh, the chance that you're not infected, given that the test says you're not infected, is substantially less than one. Francesca and I spent a fair amount of time trying to see exactly what's known about, you know, what is it? I mean, if, if you get a negative test result, does that mean you just have a 1% uh, chance that you're actually sick or a 5 or a 20% chance? And we really uh, pin that down. So um, what we uh, did is we actually uh, put a bound based on, we don't have really have expert opinion, but we're sort of based on whatever we could learn uh, that the negative predictive rate is between 0.6 and 0.9. Or to put it the other way, that uh, if you uh, get a negative result, your chance of being infected is between 0.1 and 0.4. And the formal analysis we do uses that bound. Uh, let me mention just on the side that for those of you, if anyone listening in has a medical background, uh, you may be well aware that the way the test accuracy is measured is not always by positive predictive value or negative predictive value. Very um, common in the medical literature 
to talk about the sensitivity and the specificity of the test. There's a mathematical relationship between those and the uh, measures that I'm talking about here, which we can't get into, uh, but which we, dis we discussed the relationship between them in the paper. Uh, the impact of having a so-called false negatives, that some people get negative test results, but they are actually infected, adds to the uh, reason why the actual infection rate uh, is higher than the reported rate because some people who test negative actually are infected. So the actual infection rates are uh, higher from that perspective as well. So if you put these two together, the missing data problem and the imperfect test accuracy, you have this conclusion that reported rates are lower than the actual rates. Now that's about the uh, infection rate itself. The infection rate, that basic statistic is used as an input into various other uh, statistics that are critical. Uh, because really, uh, you know, if, if infection is mild, sort of who cares really? You, if you have a mild case of the flu and you get over it, it's no big deal, at least for yourself, although you, of course you may contaminate others. Uh, but we're, what, of course, uh, enormous concern is for uh, the rates of severe illness, rates of hospitalization, uh, treatment in intensive care units, and of course, uh, death rates from the virus. So if, if we want to compute, uh, compute any of those rates, you take the data on how many people have been hospitalized and how many people have died, and you divide that by the infection rate. So the infection rates in the denominator of those rates of severe illness. And if you get the infection rate wrong, then you're gonna get the rates of severe illness wrong. And this has been a, a very, very serious matter. Let me to, to jump ahead. We're, we're gonna present data for Illinois and New York and for Italy. And in Italy, there were uh, death rates were you know, just nominally uh, among people who were viewed as infected were extremely high, like at 12%. Uh, but that of course um, is, uh, that's likely much higher than the actual death rate because the uh, rates of infection have been undercounted in the official statistics in Italy. So we'll come back to that later on. Now, try, I think there's general awareness of the uncertainty. The, uh, to deal with the uncertainty, all kinds of researchers made all kinds of assumptions to add to the weak data in order to generate uh, point estimates of these quantities and not just point estimates of the existing infection rate, but also to forecast uh, future uh, infection rates and rates of severe illness. I, I, I don't want, this is not what I'm gonna be discussing at all, but I give two references here that have received an enormous amount of attention. These are uh, epidemiological studies uh, performed at Imperial College in uh, London, which had had a very strong effect on uh, British uh, policy and has also affected American policy. And then uh, here in the US at the University of Washington uh, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, that's what you probably uh, see quoted uh, day after day now on a uh, forecast of what future death rates and illness rates will be. And uh, what they're doing is that they have access to the same data that I just talked about, but they add all kinds of assumptions to that to come up with their forecasts. Now, uh, the available estimates in the forecast, they differ quite a bit. And uh, because and the, the assumptions that people are making differ quite a bit. But there's no consensus at all about whose assumptions right. It may be that all of these epidemiological models are wrong. Okay, so that brings us to uh, what we do in the paper. Uh, and this goes way back for work that Francesca and I do, uh, this kind of work that I've been doing for 30 years, and Francesca's been doing for uh, 20 years at this point, is that uh, we think it misguided to report point estimates obtained under assumptions that are not well justified. We think it's more informative to determine the rate of um, the range of infection rates and the range of rates of severe illness that are implied by a credible spectrum of assumptions. Now, uh, there's, a, there's a very long standing way of doing this, of maintaining different kinds of assumptions and seeing uh, what kinds of results you get and trying to deal with uncertainty that way. So in many disciplines, that's called sensitivity analysis. And uh, a common practice is to obtain point estimates on, under alternative strong assumptions and then present a range of estimates. The problem with um, traditional sensitivity analysis, at least the way it's uh, traditionally been practiced, is that someone may uh, put out this assumption or that assumption, but none of them may have a good claim to realism. So, so sensitivity analysis is clearly a step in the right direction, but it doesn't go far enough at all from uh, our perspective. So what we do is we bring to bear econometric research on partial identification. Anyone who knows me or Francesca or anyone, if there's uh, any present or former students from Northwestern, uh, 
uh, who are listening in, then you certainly know what partial identification is, but uh, I'm sure many of you don't. Uh, the study of partial identification just removes the focus on destination under strong assumptions entirely. Instead, what we do is, is a kind of a sequential process. We start by posing a very weak assumptions that should be highly credible in the applied context under consideration. And the desire for credibility is extremely important for us because you can obviously get any conclusion you want by making strong assumptions. But we want to uh, ask what you can get that's credible, that's believable. Now, if you do that, then you're gonna have weaker assumptions and you just can't make the strong inferences. So typically in the uh, formal work on partial identification is that you, under uh, combining the data that's available with the assumptions that you find are believable, you can't get a point estimate of anything. Instead, you may be able to get a bound. So mathematically, formally, it's a set valued estimate, but just think of it as it's a bound instead of being able to say, for example, that. 10% of people have been uh, infected, you may be able to say it's between five and 15% or between the three and 80%, depending on the case. So you have to feel comfortable reporting results as bounds rather than as point estimates. Um, of course, you make stronger assumptions, you can narrow the bound, and that's the kind of work that we do. At the bottom of the slide, you see uh, some references. I, I've written several textbooks on this, and and an uh, enormous amount of material. Also, there's review articles, uh, including one by uh, Francesca that you can get off of her uh, web page if you want. And of course, the paper, uh, if you go online and get that, has all the references. OK, so let me talk about the methods briefly, and then I want to get to the uh, results. Uh, so this is, there's all some, uh, underneath all of this is some very simple math. It's just very basic uh, probability ideas. Uh, about laws of total probability and uh, Bayes' theorem and you know the most basic uh, uh, mathematical probability theory, which we're not going to uh, put up on the slides at all. Uh, but anyone with uh, even the, the barest undergraduate probability statistics background, I think, should be able to understand the paper easily. So what we do is we first consider the problem abstractly, uh, and then we impose some bounds, some sorry, some assumptions that we think have some uh, credibility. And these are uh, certain montanicity assumptions, which I'll explain in a moment. Once we get the bound on the infection rate, then we use that as the denominator on trying to estimate the rates of severe illness, and we get bounds on severe illness. And then, of course, once we're going to just talk about doing that over for the population as a whole. But you can condition on any attributes that you want. So I'm sure everybody is aware that the infection rate well, the infection, not so much the infection rate, but this rate of severe illness uh, has been seen to be uh, much higher uh, uh, for older people than for younger people. There's been a lot of discussion in just in the past few days about racial differences in uh, both rates of infection and in the severity of illness. And so all the analysis extends uh, to that, but we're not going to do that conditioning on patient attributes uh, here. Just, we'll just stick with the basic problem. Um, so there are a couple of formal results we show. This is actually in some simple formulas. There are two uncertainties that I talked about. There's uncertainty about the accuracy of the test and the bigger uncertainty about the infection rate of untested people. And they combine in a very simple linear fashion to yield uncertainty about the population infection rate. And, uh, and then if you think about the, uh, the fraction of people who have been tested and untested, uh, those two forces combine as well. And um, for right now, as of, you know, we're in the middle of April, the dominant issue really is a fraction of people who have not been tested. Because as I said at the beginning, the fraction who have been tested is really only about 1%. And I'll give more specific statistics for a few places in a moment. But it's just about 1%. So there's about 99% of people who have not been tested. And it, it doesn't require any math at all to see if you knew nothing about what's going on about those 99% of people then uh, you can barely draw any conclusions uh, at all. And that, that would be true even if test accuracy were known precisely. So um, uh, let me just make a kind of a side comment here that um, there's been a lot of discussion about the need for increased testing. And uh, I think one has to be very careful about interpreting this, about what would uh, be the value of increased testing. From a clinical medical perspective, increased testing would be good because then more people would know personally whether they actually have the virus or not. That's fine. 
But I think it's misleading to think that just an increase in testing per se, uh, using the existing criteria that you have to be symptomatic or have had have, have to have close contact with someone would solve the problem. Because if we're starting off with 1% people who've been tested, even if we were to do that 10 times and have 10% tested rather than 1%, you would still have uncertainty about 90% of the people. So just increasing in testing is not really going to do very much unless we got up to 50, 60, 70, 80% of people tested. The real issue, which has been very well recognized among statisticians working on this, is that what we need is random testing of the population. And random testing does not require having uh, a very large number of people tested. There's the kind of the magic beauty of random sampling is that if we were to just get 5,000, 10,000 people uh, tested out of uh, 300 million um, and know that the, it's a true random sample rather than a selected sample, there's an enormous amount that we could uh, learn. Many statisticians have been saying this since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, as in the United States, I have not seen any moves towards uh, random testing yet. Uh, people have been pleading to do it, but it just has not been done. So again, I won't say anything further about random testing uh, for now, but that's uh, just be, uh, it's an important point to make. Okay, so as I said, we bring to bear uh, two assumptions because the kind of testing that's been done is very non-random, it's very selective. And so the T assumption we use is what we call testing monotonicity, which is as shown on the slide, that the present criteria require a person to show disease symptoms ought to have been in close contact with someone who's tested positive. Well, if you think about that, then uh, Francesca and I came to the conclusion that this would be credible to assume that the infection rate among people who have been tested is higher than the rate among untested people. Okay, so if we get to observe some tested rate among the, uh, some infected rate among people who have been tested, then the people who haven't been tested, they must have a lower in, uh, rate of infection. It may be just a little bit lower, it may be very much lower, it could even be zero, but uh, it's gonna be lower. So that's a formal assumption that lets us get some results. There's a second assumption here, which just comes free, temporal monotonicity, uh, which I don't really wanna get into. It just says, if we're looking at this over time, and over time, the, uh, uh, the fractions have to increase just logically, because a person who's been infected by an early date necessarily has been infected by every later date. So that, that's not really an assumption, that's just a logical condition. So those are the only two assumptions that maintain. Okay, that's all I'm gonna talk about on the methodology. You can go to the paper and uh, see the uh, math to get behind it. So let me go on and talk about the data and the results and then uh, some uh, close up comments and then we'll conclude because I know we wanna keep this to just uh, 30 minutes and I'm watching my clock here. Um, so uh, we could do this from anywhere, but I'm sitting here in Illinois. Uh, Francesca's in uh, New York. Uh, Francesca, being Italian, also has some uh, uh, personal interest there. And I think everyone's been interested in the situation in Italy as well, uh, given how high the problem has been there. So we decided to focus on Illinois, New York, and uh, Italy. Uh, the data sets are uh, sources are official data coming from uh, different departments of health in the United States and the Italian equivalent. The data are the, the data that you see discussed every day. Uh, first cumulative counts of the number of persons tested and number of positive test results. We have that data daily from Italy from February and then in March in Illinois and New York. We actually use the data in the paper only beginning March 16th because we wanted to have a common uh, starting point at a point where there are enough cases to make it interesting. So we started on March 16th because there were at least 100 confirmed cases as of that date in all three places. Um, for Italy, we have more data than we do for the US because we actually have the counts of a number of, of people who've been hospitalized, treated in the intensive care unit and death. And uh, in the US, we don't have it for hospitalization and treatment in intensive care unit. So uh, we can't present results for the US now. The data must be there underneath, but we didn't have access to it. Okay, let me go uh, first on the results. First, the, what's in the raw data, the inferences that we draw from the raw data. The, uh, over this period, March 16th to April 6th, the fraction of people tested uh, increased from zero to half a percent in Illinois. It increased in New York from just a tenth of a percent to 1.7 percent in New York, and in uh, Italy from two tenths of a percent to 1.2 percent. So that just verifies what I said before, that basically it's about 1% of people being tested uh, right now at different locations. 
Now, the fractions of positive test results are quite different from place to place because the testing protocols from place to place, you know, what it takes to be tested uh, differs from place to place and also the uh, uh, severity, you know, the uh, rates of illness. So the uh, fraction of positive test results has varied during this period from about uh, uh, roughly 9% uh, uh, to 20% uh, in Illinois, from 13% to 40% in New York, and in Italy, it stayed roughly around 20% uh, across the people uh, test positive. We have a caution here against comparing these quantities across places or over time because the criteria for testing, the accuracy of the testing uh, may be different across uh, locations and time. Now, for Italy, we also have the, uh, you know, the rates of severe illness. And uh, these fractions on the slide look very, very small because this is taking the, the number of people hospitalized divided by the entire population size of 60 million or 70 million or whatever it is in Italy. So those are small fractions of the entire population. Of course, they're much larger fractions of the affected people, but you can see what, the, uh, what those rates are for uh, in the raw data from Italy. Okay, now these are the uh, ultimate results. Um, this is a class in, when you do partial identification analysis, you get used to having a cup half full and half empty. Uh, that we would uh, like to get very strong, tight bounds on things. The getting strong, tight bounds on things requires assumptions that just may not have believability. On the other hand, if you assume nothing, you're not gonna learn anything. So we make some assumptions that we think are uh, credible, but they're not that strong. These are the montanicity assumptions. And what you can get from those assumptions formally, just by going through the simple equations and then plugging in the numbers that I just talked about, is a bounds on the uh, actual infection rate as opposed to the reported infection rate in Illinois, New York, and Italy, that uh, it, it really is sort of half full and half empty because these bounds basically have a width of around 0.5. Because if you knew nothing at all, you would just say the infection rate's between zero and one. So the bound would be of width one. If you knew everything, the bound would be of width zero, but we're able to narrow this down to about half that length. Uh, Tenth of a percent to 51% roughly in uh, Illinois. Again, tenth of a percent to uh, 64, 65% in New York, and then very low, uh, thir uh, three tenths of a percent to 51% uh, percent in Italy. Now, the fact that these bounds, as of this time in uh, April, are still so the width is so substantial is because 99% of people have not been tested. So, if we assume nothing, you would just get a bound that's of width 0.99 we're able to basically cut that in half. So there is some information content uh, uh, in this. And if you've been looking at all the point estimates that have been around, they're all over the place. You know, if you take the data at face value, the infection rate's been very low, but I've seen reported in the media that the true infection rate is as much as 30 or 40%. It depends on who you read. People have been doing all kinds of uh, back of the envelope calculations. And, but these are kind of, firm, credible bounds. Still, they're wide, but they're, but I think uh, pretty firm. Now, uh, if you look at the rate of severe illness, we get bounds that uh, look more informative, tighter. This is for Italy, that if you look at the rates uh, of in hospitalization, in being an intensive care unit or uh, death in Italy, that they're bounded between one tenth of a percent and 17 percent, uh, zero and uh, two percent, and one tenth of a percent and 8.6 percent. Now, let me just focus on that very last figure, 8.6% is an upper bound that we get on the rate of death in Italy. That actually is informative because the number that's been going around, if you take the statistics at face value, is that the death rate in Italy has been 12.5% as of April the 6th. That's if you just take the numbers at face value, which is very high. So we're able to get that down to 8.6%. That's still probably, my guess is that's still much higher than the true death rate, but uh, that's the upper bound that we get. Okay, so those are the results we want to report. There's uh, uh, the tables with full sets of results day by day for each of these places on the paper, but uh, this gives you a uh, sense of the summary. Okay, let me uh, finish up. First, um, some discussion. Uh, come back to this basic question. You may, you get these bounds and the bounds, uh, basic bounds are still some quite wide. You may prefer to get narrow bounds, but there is this logical problem that the only way you can get narrower bounds is to impose stronger assumptions. You impose strong enough assumptions, I could tighten these bounds as much as I want. 
the problems when Francesca and I really searched through the literature, what we thought was credible versus not credible, we did not see an immediately a credible basis to add much stronger assumptions. In the paper, there is one uh, additional assumption that we entertain and we present results on it uh, based on an expert of opinion or judgment of, uh, of Dr. Fauci, who's been, you know, everyone's been seeing every day. But we do that mostly for illustration because we didn't want to really rely too much on that. Uh, if you want to get tighter bounds, you can do it if you want to make stronger assumptions and determine their implications. Let me uh, note in, uh, that, uh, that even though we, you know, we've been trying to take quite some care in expressing uncertainty, there are yet other sources of uncertainty that we abstract from this paper. And I want to list them here. Uh, Francesca and I don't think they're of the same level of uh, magnitude in, in, in importance, but, but they, they may well be in some occasion, uh, circumstances. First, we assume that you cannot be infected anew, so that once you recover from the disease, then you become immune. And of course, there's been a lot of discussion of that recently. So we maintain that assumption in the paper. We also assume that people are test, who are tested are tested only once. That's obviously not true. There are some people who are tested uh, multiple times. But our impression is the fraction of people who are tested multiple times um, is fairly small. And so we, uh, th that would complicate the math quite a bit if uh, people could be uh, retested. The interpretation of the testing data would be uh, hard. Uh, third, and this can, be, can matter, is we're assuming that hospitals correctly diagnose patients and that public records correctly code causes of death. There's been some concern on that as well, particularly about uh, understating uh, deaths from COVID because of people dying at home and they never get tested. So those assumptions may not be accurate. Francesca and I know how to incorporate them. We could redo our analysis allowing uncertainty of those, but we wanted to keep this uh, fairly transparent so we didn't actually do it in the paper. A very short remark uh, to the uh, econometricians and statisticians here is that when we give these uh, numbers, we don't call them estimates or these bounds. We don't call them estimates and we don't provide any measures of statistical precision. And uh, the reason is that you can measure statistical precision by a standard error or a confidence interval or whatever if you have some well-defined sampling process generating the data. But that's not how these data are generated. These are population data. We have full data for Illinois, New York, and uh, Italy. So there is no sampling process that's obvious. So we just uh, stay away from, uh, from that. Okay, uh, finally, last slide. Um, I've said that the bounds can be narrowed by imposing stronger assumptions. A much more satisfactory way to increase our knowledge of the infection rate is to obtain better data. So I just want to end by uh, posing two things that we uh, think are very important. One I've already uh, uh, emphasized greatly is that random testing of populations would contribute enormously. I mean, it, it just, that would resolve a very large part of the current uh, uncertainty if we were to do random testing of populations. Uh, the other issue is about the um, test accuracy. There seems to be uh, great uncertainty about the uh, negative predictive value. And whenever I see new tests that are discussed, like the new test from Abbott Laboratories just north of Chicago, I could find no mention of uh, test accuracy in any of what I could find online about that. So I think there's, there's a real need to get um, data on uh, test accuracy, and we hope that someone uh, will.